Hello, everyone, dear colleagues and guests. Welcome to 20th International Field Talks of the Philosophy Department at Marmara University. With this talk, we complete the last, the last talk of this year's series. Today, as a speaker, we are honored to have Dr. Ali Savuroğlu from Galatasaray University in Istanbul. If I introduce Ali Savuroğlu to you, he did his undergraduate study, studies in the philosophy department at Boğaziçi University. He finished his master's thesis at Sorbonne in France. He wrote his doctoral thesis at Galatasaray University. Currently, he works as an assistant professor in the philosophy department at the same university and teaches introduction to philosophy, epistemology, introduction to ontology, and introduction to logic. His main research areas are epistemology, ontology, and logic. This today's talk is entitled Language as a Power Game, a Wittgensteinian Perspective. So please join us and follow Dr. Rajasaro's talk. Thank you in advance. Uh, okay. Uh, hi to everybody present here. Uh, I am extremely honored uh, to be with uh, such a distinguished uh, audience. Uh, dear faculty members, I am really pleased uh, to meet with you in person. Uh, as uh, Ali Said uh, stated, uh, the talk is entitled uh, Power Game uh, in Wittgenstein. Uh, I choose uh, the power uh, word uh, with a reason, because I think that uh, games or language games uh, in fact uh, ultimately leads uh, to a power uh, play in real life so from the many possible perspectives uh, political structures and uh, linguistic structures uh, resembles so i will use uh, this sort of uh, connection between two domains to explain uh, more or uh, what Wittgenstein uh, wanted to say uh, in his private language argument. And the ultimate uh, catch up, uh, catch uh, would be, uh, can we talk uh, something as a private political position as uh, Wittgenstein uh, talked about the private uh, language uh, content? Uh, you will see what uh, what are my uh, thoughts on this, and uh, let us begin, uh, if you want. Uh, I will try to process uh, quickly. Uh, unfortunately, uh, since uh, my uh, Boazici years, I never really talked uh, in academic English. Uh, so please uh, accept uh, my apologies uh, for small all uh, glitches uh, in my uh, presentation. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, today we will discuss Wittgenstein's uh, private language uh, thesis. Uh, in the history of philosophy, we sometimes encounter special moments. The private language thesis, I think, can be such a moment. In any case, I think that it is uh, really the case. In these uh, special moments, we witness the breaking of the old paradigm and the emergence of a new uh, era. This breaking is not always uh, apparent. It is possible that the philosophers addressing the topic may not even have noticed the issue themselves. Uh, Wittgenstein developed private language thesis in his later period, as uh, all uh, you know. Uh, Wittgenstein, in this uh, later period, concludes that a totally private and hidden inner language is impossible. Uh, I will attempt uh, to read uh, this thesis in a more personal and radical way. I will imply that for both Wittgenstein and the tradition of Western philosophy, private language thesis is somehow destructive. I believe that Wittgenstein exploration can, can take us further away 
than what himself thought. We can uh, follow even more uh, to the limits uh, his uh, arguments. Finally, I think that the private language argument is interesting because it can lead us to novel insights about the nature of the language and can help us to discover new orientations uh, in philosophy itself. Uh, Wittgenstein also thought uh, quite in a similar way, and he said that uh, quite explicitly. We shall come to this uh, later. Uh, my friend Adisait made a very interesting speech in Galatasaray University recently. Uh, this was about the depths uh, of the Western uh, philosophy. I think that we can say with some irony that Wittgenstein here takes the role of uh, of a grave uh, digger. Wittgenstein uh, too, I think, seems to think that the Western philosophy uh, is uh, moribund, is uh, just uh, not live uh, enough. We shall come to that later, as I said. He is clearly contributing to the destruction of the philosophy, and he is well aware of it. In philosophical investigations, he says, uh, quote, where does our investigation get its importance from, since it seems only to destroy everything interesting, that is, all that is great and important. As it were all the buildings, leaving behind only bits of stone and rubble. What we are destroying is nothing but houses of cards, and we are clearing up to the ground of language on which they stand. And Further, we read the quote, Wittgenstein who speaks here. What I want to teach is to pass from an obvious nonsense to obvious nonsense. As, as it is by now, Wittgenstein compares much of the Western philosophy to rubble. It is a re really uh, radical, radical and uh, extreme uh, conclusion, isn't it? In this sense, I connect uh, this issue with the speech of Ali Said about the death of Western philosophy. In my uh, opinion, Wittgenstein could be held as a uh, witness of this death because uh, he is clearly speaking of the destruction, of the rubble, of the ruins of uh, Western philosophy. Uh, why he is so pessimistic about the matter uh, will be discussed uh, in a minute also. Uh, provided, provided that we agree with Wittgenstein, we are invited to make face to this obvious nonsense and perhaps erect a new philosophy on the rubbles of the old one. Uh, as it must be apparent now, we are dealing with a very explosive uh, content. Let us now quickly go to the subject matter. What is his argument about the private language or the impossibility of private language? A private language argument thesis can be found in philosophical investigations, as uh, you all know. Uh, but it is uh, in a quite dispersed uh, arrangement. It, uh, it is between uh, many paragraphs. It is uh, between uh, 244 and uh, 271. Or even uh, it can be found uh, till uh, 315, etc. Uh, and as uh, we all know, uh, philosophical investigations uh, corresponds to the second period of Wittgenstein. Uh, he reconsidered uh, much of his earlier thoughts expressed uh, in Tractatus. Uh, as uh, Erdal Hoja said uh, uh, previously, uh, 
in Tractatus, uh, he was a correspondent, correspondentist uh, in terms of the uh, language philosophy. In uh, philosophical investigations, uh, he totally uh, abandoned uh, this uh, position. There is no possible correspondence in this uh, later work, uh, according to Wittgenstein, between a meaning and a fact, for example. So, uh, a very classical uh, position in the epistemology is uh, left uh, behind in this new work. Wittgenstein uh, has a new proposal uh, and a really destructive uh, criticism. There is two things who, cons who concern us in this uh, discussion. First, we we should uh, understand well what is the criticism of Wittgenstein about the private language uh, case. And this criticism is really uh, successful, I think. And then there is a second part. This is the solution of Wittgenstein. Uh, once we accept that the criticism is uh, okay, the solution is uh, to explain uh, this concept of meaning, uh, co how it works, uh, what uh, what can be said about the meaning, uh, what is a social game uh, is in this context. Uh, should we define meaning uh, in an externalistic way, for example, as a play between uh, many people in a given context, in real life, in real geography, etc. Uh, the second part is uh, a solution or an attempt to solution by Wittgenstein. And for this second part, I will be rather uh, critic on Wittgenstein uh, proposition. I think that uh, his uh, game theory about the language uh, does not uh, save him uh, from the destructive, destructive conclusion that he uh, proposed in the first part. We shall come to this. Uh, Later, uh, suppose that someone someone wants uh, to invent an absolutely private language, uniquely for his own uh, usage. Now I am try. I will try to briefly resume uh, what is a private language uh, problem in Wittgenstein. Uh, quickly, I hope. Uh, no one, no one should understood this language, and no one other than the owner should decipher the, its meaning in any given situation. This is the requirement of the private language thesis. Uh, why this name of private language thesis? Uh, just uh, think about it. I think it is connected with Russell, Bertrand Russell, because Bertrand Russell, in one of his uh, uh, writing uh, invented this idea of uh, private uh, language to explain the meaning, uh, the consciousness uh, in a Cartesian sense. For Russell, has an inner private language, and he even Russell thought about uh, this private language uh, and he just imagined that we can have a perfect private language arranged uh, in a logical way. It would be uh, the task of the philosophy to restructure and reinvent uh, this perfect inner language, which would be the grammar of the personal private thought. This was a Russellian uh, proposition. I think Wittgenstein attacked uh, Russell in behind the curtains by uh, using this uh, epitaph, uh, I mean private language thesis. It is against Russell. You can imagine that the discussion is against Russell and or friends of Russell somehow. Uh, of course, it is much more general. The, uh, consequences of his uh, criticism, in, but we can uh, perfectly imagine Russell as the central point of it. So we were saying that this private 
language uh, would be totally private. So in any possible case, it could not be understood by someone else, even if uh, the other person has access to documents about this language. It would never understand the content of this private, hidden, personal language. It is not only private, it is also uh, personal. Uh, personal in the sense of a consciousness, only this consciousness who can read and have this language and no other one. Uh, now uh, comes the question, how can we invent such a private language? What is the means of uh, having this language? It is not uh, rather uh, automatically created such a language because we can all feel things in a singular way. I am accepting this. Uh, we can have we can all have contents in in our minds in a very private and singular way, but we cannot name them easily because uh, things who are uh, really singular and who occurs once in a lifetime cannot have uh, easily names. So having uh, private feelings is one thing, but naming them, identifying them, or classifying them uh, in a linguistic uh, structure is another thing. Here we are clearly discussing about the creation of such a meaning structure about our inner feelings. Wittgenstein does not refuse the possibility of inner or private feelings, but rather he refuses the possibility of constructing, constructing a really private language about these inner feelings. Uh, I am returning to my uh, writings. Uh, the only way for Wittgenstein, he says that uh, in many uh, different uh, passages, uh, the inventor of this language, I mean the keeper of this private language, needs to stipulate some rules for his private language, because without rules, no language is necessary is uh, possible. Uh, there is uh, petitions, there is a grammar, there is uh, structures in languages, all we know that. And in this sense, uh, even a private language, according to Wittgenstein, uh, requires uh, such a definite rules. This uh, rules concept is really essential to Wittgenstein uh, criticism. We shall come back to this uh, frequently. If we accept, uh, just imagine the contrary. If we accept uh, a language without, without rules, it would be just unstructured noise and would be unintelligible even for the speaker itself. Without rules, he, each time he would use another word, another grammar, another verb uh, to express the same thing. So there would be no regularity and there would be no pattern uh, cogniz uh, for cognition in this uh, unstructured uh, noise. The language, this would not be a language. It would just an internal noise uh, without meaning at all, according to the question. If any, then uh, can, uh, let's come back to creation of the rules. Suppose that uh, we need really to create rules. It is the case, I think. Uh, in this case, if rules exist, uh, uh, if any rules are established, other persons can also learn them. Those rules can be stolen. The speaker can be made to confess them under torture. Uh, in any case, uh, once uh, some sort of uh, rules are specified, these rules uh, can be 
şey or can can be discovered uh, or can be uh, deduced uh, as or you know uh, in uh, World War Two uh, any uh, hidden uh, message uh, did not remain hidden uh, the structure the hidden structure uh, are discovered. Each times by uh, reverse engineering, the rules uh, who are used to encrypt uh, these uh, military messages. So, if you you have a, if you have an algorithm, it is a, another name for the rule. Uh, then this algorithm can be reverse engineered or uh, made to confess under torture. Uh, so, uh, in this case it would not be absolutely private because Wittgenstein, when he says uh, absolute, he, he understands uh, in all possible worlds. So if there is a rule in their one uh, scenario, the such rules are made uh, to confess uh, under torture, etc. And this uh, blocks the absolute uh, requirement of the totally private language uh, condition. Uh, I am rather agreeing on these points uh, with Wittgenstein. Even in logic or mathematics, uh, you don't invent a language without specifying rules. A creation of a formal language, uh, this is it's uh, clearly the invention or creation or definition of rules. Without rules, no language, uh, neither in logic nor in any other domains. Uh, so let us to reformulate in four points his private language thesis in a more uh, compact uh, way. Wittgenstein says that the meaning is public because private language uh, is not possible. Wittgenstein argues that the meaning of language is fundamentally tied to its use uh, in a social context. Words gain their meaning through the public, shared practice of a linguistic community. Uh, all this is said, uh, assuming that private language is utterly impossible. The uh, second point about his uh, proposition, it is the rule following. Wittgenstein emphasizes the role of rule following in language uh, use. The meaning of a word is not something intrans intrinsic uh, to the word itself, but is derived uh, from the way it is used within a set of rules or language games. I think we can all agree this uh, second point. Because, for example, uh, I could say, make uh, attention, I use the language, you cannot easily infer uh, what is my warning is about, uh, what, what I am uh, saying in that, uh, make attention to what, it is not uh, automatically uh, visible uh, from my uh, proposition. I can even specify more. Uh, I could say, make attention to, to the car, for, for example. Uh, but which car? Uh, this could be the car near us. Generally, it is the case because uh, we are living in a big city with a lot of traffic. Uh, but, and I could. Uh, Maybe speaking about a car in space, for example, Elon Musk sent a, a, a Tesla to the space, uh, as you know. Uh, or uh, even if I show uh, with my hand a direction, uh, this direction uh, goes to the infinity. So in order to really fix about which cars I am uh, making the warning, you have to consider all the cars in the world, in the universe, and decide uh, by a probabilistic account which is really the car uh, in question. So there is uh, this uh, problem of reference. This is why 
we need a linguistic uh, gain or an established uh, uh, rules and practices to simplify this insolvable question. Uh, in general, as we are in uh, schools, uh, children is taught to make attention to such a warnings. So we are socially conditioned to uh, regard uh, suddenly to the near car or to the near traffic or the near uh, dangers uh, when such a warning is uh, explicitly formulated. So without a social training, behind uh, this uh, usage of language, the language itself doesn't make sense by its own. This is the thesis of Wittgenstein. The private ostensive definition. Wittgenstein discusses the idea of someone trying to create a private language by associating words with private sensations. He argues that this would be impossible because there would be no external public criteria to check whether the association is correct. Without a public standard or rule, the speaker wouldn't even know if they were using the word, the word, the same word, consistently over time. Uh, what is this point of Einstein? Imagine that uh, in my inner self, I decided to use a word for a specific condition. For example, uh, each time I drink from my cup, I feel something, uh, the, the taste of the coffee, and I just decided to call it by a special name that I invented just now. But the problem, the next time I do the same act, uh, Sinan Uja does the same uh, to check whether I am uh, correct. Uh, the next time I do the same act, uh, how can I show that the taste is the same? So my uh, second attribution of the name invented just uh, beforehand uh, would not be uh, utilizable, utilizable, would not be useful in this context because I cannot uh, reference to a previous experience. It is gone for this previous experience. Previous test is gone forever. It was a singular test, even if I invented a name for it. Once it is uh, uh, tasted, it is gone. It is uh, maybe in memory, but in a faint way, it is not the same thing. So I can never be sure that the same singular test uh, could be repeated in future or even now. So attribution of the same word to the same uh, uh, specific inner experience is absurd because we are just saying that these experiences are singular. Each by its own. So how can we group them in a more general concept? Uh, it is not possible uh, in this context. And finally, uh, this is the community or understanding, the uh, fourth point about his uh, language argument. Uh, According language, according, according to Wittgenstein, only functions uh, within a community. Understanding a language involves participating in the communal practices that give uh, words the meaning. Without this communal context, language would lose uh, its meaning. Many authors, many authors, including Kripke, criticized, criticized uh, Wittgenstein position on private language. Generally, it is believed that this leads to an untenable skepticism. It does, I agree that it leads us to an untenable uh, skepticism. 
we shall see soon why. But uh, this criticism, I think, misses the point because Wittgenstein himself uh, adopts uh, this uh, skepticism in a rather uh, uh, easy way. It wouldn't bother Wittgenstein that his position is uh, skeptical. In any case, he is speaking about the rebels, the destruction, about the confusion, etc. So he wouldn't be bothered uh, with these accusations that what he says uh, crumbles everything meaningfully. He would say, yes, what I say crumbles everything meaningfully to the ground. So what he would say. In this sense, uh, the criticism of Kripke uh, miss uh, really uh, the point. Uh, he, he, he's trying to use the final uh, tag, final uh, intention of Wittgenstein against himself. Wittgenstein wants to distract old philosophy. Uh, so you cannot criticize, criticize him saying that this would distract this fact everything, for example. Uh, maybe now, uh, maybe uh, we could pass to the second part of my uh, exposition. Uh, what are the consequences uh, of this uh, thesis of Einstein? When private, when we accept that private language is impossible, uh, what we need uh, to abandon in philosophy? What we, what would be uh, and tenable from now on. Uh, first point, the impossibility of a private language gives a blow to the classical Cartesian view of mind, I think. Descartes believed he could engage in self-dialogue about his experiences, all the while asserting justification in claiming ignorance about the external world. He, along with others, reasoned that even if errors could occur regarding the external world, absolute, absolute certainty could be achieved by limiting judgments solely to immediate sensations. But after a private language argument, can Descartes have, have this inner dialogue about his thoughts. I think that he cannot. Uh, he could not identify inwardly his experiences. Let's say it more clearly. Without an inner and private language, he could just feel, feel things, but he could not think them. I mean, he could not identify and name his singular mental experiences. He can have them, but he cannot uh, name them. This is uh, what Wittgenstein uh, talks about. Uh, and in this sense, uh, without the ability of naming the inner thoughts, Descartes could not make uh, deductions or justifications. He could not have this inner inner thought that we all know uh, about uh, his uh, book. And uh, losing Descartes in the history of philosophy is a tremendous blow to the philosophy in this sense, to the tradition of uh, philosophy in this sense, because uh, you are knowing more than uh, myself that uh, a lot of Western philosophy, actual or uh, past uh, base is based uh, on the Cartesian tradition. Without Descartes, uh, can we imagine Husserl, Husserl Husserl? Without Descartes, can we imagine Kant, etc.? Uh, it would be very difficult. Many philosophers uh, include Descartes. Uh, that our private internal thoughts or impressions are the most uh, readily accessible data for us to investigate. 
This is why uh, Descartes in his Cartesian meditations uh, starts our, uh, with his uh, inner thought, with his, uh, his uh, inner uh, impressions, because they are uh, just there. They are just immediately accessible. They are just present. If a private language is impossible, such an internal and immediate cognition can, cannot be described. Although, although Wittgenstein did not name Descartes explicitly, this is a devastating blow to Descartes and to post-Cartesian tradition. Uh, the other issue, uh, I will uh, just uh, more uh, quickly. Uh, some, uh, now uh, just uh, talk about some criticism uh, about Wittgenstein. For example, uh, Kripke, Saul Kripke. Uh, his uh, criticism of Wittgenstein are very consequential uh, and leads uh, the way, I think. He said that uh, if you accept that a private language is utterly impossible, this leads us to a skeptical conclusion. According to Kripke, Wittgenstein's thesis is against the traditional view that meaning is determined by a mental image or a set of private criteria. Then, in this situation, what meaning is becomes blurry because according to Kripke, Wittgenstein do not uh, precise how a rule should be socially followed in a given situation. In this later point about the solution of Wittgenstein to the problem, I think Kripke could have uh, a point because uh, many games can be played and uh, what would be a rule in a given game uh, could be problematic. However, uh, I think that Kripke cannot invalidate Wittgenstein by pointing out to some negative consequences. Maybe the solution of Wittgenstein is not uh, sufficient, uh, but uh, the criticism uh, could be really uh, to the point. Uh, now, uh, just let us discuss about the rules and the proposition of Wittgenstein, because uh, the later part of my talk is about the power games, about the politics, and about games and rules. Uh, I think this part is maybe more interesting than the Wittgenstein part, I hope. Uh, what means the rules? Uh, it is clear that in Wittgenstein, rules are required to understand the concept of meaning and rules of a game. Okay. In philosophical writings, game rules function as a substitute for meaning, clearly. So understand rules and you will understand uh, rules, uh, meaning. So it is uh, quite similar to Kant. Kant. I assume that everybody knows Kant. Kant, uh, uh, schemata of Kant uh, functions uh, like Wittgenstein rules. What is schemata in Kant context? Uh, schemata or schemes are the rules uh, in order to apply concepts uh, to the uh, sensitivity and imagine uh, uh, to the uh, sensory content without. Uh, schemes or schemata in Kant, you cannot uh, discover how you will apply a concept to a situation. Uh, Wittgenstein's uh, game rules uh, function in a similar way. Of course, this is not this time in a mind, but it is in a social context, in external world, in a socially uh, shared uh, practice. The rules are defined, but 
with the help of these rules, uh, we know how to attribute which word to which situation. We are just uh, educated. Uh, it is. It comes with practice and with repetition. We are conditioned in a game to react in a similar way, in similar situations, each time. And this is all Wittgenstein uh, talks about the meaning. Meaning is just such a case. Ultimately, I think uh, it makes uh, the meaning issue uh, quite similar to a Pavlovian uh, reflex, because uh, it is something that we have to train on a social context, in a game, with rules, etc. Rules are trainings. Uh, maybe there's a connection to Hume also, because in Hume, causality, as we all know, uh, is uh, established uh, by repetition and by a psychological habit of the person. Uh, this function exactly in a similar way in Wittgenstein. In again, uh, repetitions, so you learn how a rule functions, and later uh, you can use uh, this rule in similar situations to understand words. It is that simple. Maybe it is not that simple. We shall come to this too. But uh, a uh, last point about Hume, uh, it is one of the points of criticism of Kripke. In Wittgenstein, Kripke says that the unique sensation cannot be described. This is what I said uh, uh, before. And it is uh, quite similar, says Kripke, to Hume. In Hume, a unique causation cannot be described. Because causation in Hume needs a repetition. And it is only a social, uh, Hume not, did not use the word social, but it is just a, a custom or habit uh, who, who comes to life uh, with the help of this uh, repetition, uh, something who happened who happens once, only once, absolutely once, cannot be causally connected in Hume because there would be no repetition and there would be no custom arising from this repetition. Uh, Kripke says that Wittgenstein used exactly the same uh, observation. A sensation cannot be connected to a meaning because it is only once and it is just a singular sensation. And if a repetition is needed, uh, this repetition also needs a social context. Uh, maybe this later point is not so clear, but we can discuss. Uh, I see that uh, I used uh, 45 minutes already. I am trying to go quickly. Uh, uh, let's agree with Wittgenstein for a while, for the time being, that private language is uh, really uh, impossible, just for the sake of the discussion. And uh, let's talk about more about his uh, social game uh, proposal. I think uh, Kripke accusation of uh, skepticism is uh, correct. Although this is not a problem with Wittgenstein, but we can think that it is a problem for us or even for Wittgenstein. Why not? Because uh, all then different language games or different meaning networks compete for each other in the search in the search for truth. For example, what would be Wittgenstein's answer to the conflicting games? because they are not uh, playing the same game uh, in the world. There is alternating and conflicting 
and social practices and uh, human uh, networks who are, who are in play one against each other. This is the real life. There is not a single game in uh, in that in this game we all participate peacefully, etc. This is not a case. There is rather conflicting games, alternative games, uh, incompatible games, uh, and even inside the game there is uh, bad players, good players, uh, the one who cheats, etc. So a game just by being a game, socially constructed game, does not function in a uniform way. So even if there is rules and the game itself is a basis for meaning, uh, the fluidity of the game and its internal uh, conflicts can make uh, the proposal of Wittgenstein uh, quite uh, problematic. Uh, one of the main uh, criticism of my own under Wittgenstein, even if uh, he invalidates a uh, private language, uh, his solution returns to a sort of private language thesis unknown to him, the game uh, proposal. The game and the rules as a network uh, in an anti-subjective anti uh, anti uh, world cannot really solve uh, the problem because Wittgenstein, maybe he doesn't see this clearly. Uh, the problem does not arise uh, because uh, the first uh, case uh, was uh, private. But uh, we are connecting the meaning to something we call consciousness. Uh, the, one of the real reasons of this problem could be the description, description of the consciousness as a philosophical term uh, that we all know, but we never understand uh, quite enough. Uh, even if a real game is played universally by all the humans. Is uh, this game uh, would be sufficient? I think not. Because uh, the same uh, possibilities or difficulties of attributing or uh, solving uh, the singular cases would be the same even if this game is played universally. Something who occurs one event, even if the whole world was uh, just there and witnessing it, would be equally problematic. In a collective or in an individual way, we could not attach a meaning to something who occurred only once. Don't forget, this difficulty was one of the, one of the main uh, criticism of Wittgenstein. Uh, now I will resume uh, my own uh, thoughts about uh, games as uh, power games and politics. Uh, maybe there is something in this game proposal, but other than Wittgenstein uh, thought, uh, Wittgenstein uh, always uh, returns to the meaning part uh, in this discussion. And the consciousness, uh, either collective or uh, individual, uh, plays uh, a big role in this discussion. But in the real games, maybe there's other things too that Wittgenstein doesn't uh, discuss in us. For example, the external part of the game, the terrain, it is not part of the consciousness. The real world, uh, Roles, uh, limitations, uh, distances. Uh, imagine the football game. There is uh, possible, there is possible uh, cases. I mean, the, the players cannot uh, fly, for example, or a uh, ball on uh, the distance between two uh, points of the terrain is uh, limited, etc. 
they are all physically uh, determined uh, conditions. Maybe the world uh, in itself uh, has have such rules who uh, decides for us in a game the outcome of this game independently of what we think about the game. If uh, we could uh, maybe follow or uh, make attention to this part, play it with uh, the world itself, not with the human players, but the part of the world who is uh, effective in the game, maybe we can find a solution uh, to this uh, dilemma. Uh, again, uh, as you all know, is very frequent. Uh, even animals play games. And what is more astonishing, we know that animals and humans can play games uh, mutually. For example, everybody, I'm sure, play cats uh, in this room. Uh, so uh, my last question, who will connect us to the power politics, is this. Why we play games? What is the usefulness of games in our lives? Why evolution uh, conditioned us, not us, but animals, to, to play games? Uh, because playing a game is a very wasteful activity. It doesn't bring uh, immediate benefits. I think uh, games uh, functions uh, as uh, selection mechanisms. Because in a game, even if you are an animal or a human child, by practicing, by following rules, you eliminate bad uh, movements from the good movements. The game itself is a training uh, to do something very economically and efficiently. This is why rules exist in games. So games in general function as a sort of lenses, optic lenses, who focuses, who focus and who concentrates things. Uh, in this sense, I think that games function as uh, selection mechanisms. And as each selection mechanism, uh, this is what is uh, in question, is to simplify uh, something uh, chaotic to another thing more orderly and more uh, uh, simple. Because uh, Applying a rule is uh, selecting things and discarding or rejecting other things. Uh, uh, this is the nature of the rule. There's two aspects of a rule. To, uh, you, either, you either accept the outcome or you reject the outcome. So, in general, games are the answer of the evolution to the problem of uh, survival. By practicing games, the living organisms, in fact, make selections, make uh, classifications. In short, they discover how to function more economically and more efficiently. In this sense, this sort of selection mechanism, I think, can be thought as a basis for meaning. I would call meaning in this sense, this is my own uh, personal opinion, is to have a, such a selective uh, structure. Discarding things and accepting other things is the basis of the meaning. There is a selection behind the meaning. And again, perfectly exemplifies such a selection. In this sense, again, can be thought as a sort of synonym of the meaning in this selective behavior. And then I will connect this to the politics. What in politics uh, we talk all the time about the selective nature of politics, because it is very hierarchical. There is a hierarchy in politics. There is selection 
uh, not everything is permitted to everybody. There's classes. Uh, the human societies are layered. So in this sense, uh, rules are everywhere in a political environment. In this sense, I had the thought that the politics itself function also as a selective game and they create meaning by just uh, rejecting some behavior and by allowing other types of behavior. In fact, there is uh, evidently something negative about this rejection and uh, allowing other things, etc. I am agreeing with this. But although there is some negative aspects of it, uh, this selective attitude that politics uh, produce can be sort of uh, evolution's answer to the survival problem. Because uh, when there is uh, political uh, management, uh, human societies can uh, do some tasks more uh, in a more effective way and in a more economical way. In this sense, I think that the language itself is a power structure uh, as a language. I don't mean that we can use language in power uh, relationships. The contrary, I am saying, the language itself is uh, the very power uh, structure uh, of our species. And finally, I would love to terminate uh, my conclusions. I would say that uh, the, the real question, why the evolution conditioned us in a such a way that we have a, such a political institutions and we have such a big uh, game uh, spaces? This is a very interesting question because uh, politics and games are waste, uh, wasteful and uh, we are just wasting time uh, in them and they have uh, a lot of negative consequences too and despite all these negative aspects if such sort of uh, behavior uh, uh, remains in a long history of evolution there must be some benefits uh, to came uh, from them and my answer to this is to say that just by being inspired uh, from Wittgenstein, I think that these games, Jou, uh, uh, sorry for the French part, uh, I think that these games play sort of uh, selective uh, selection. The games uh, select, the games uh, in this sense simplify, the games in this sense train and helps us to see structure in many possible situations uh, when there is so many possibilities, endless possibilities in a given situation, it is uh, equal to the chaos. But again, by selecting and by uh, allowing only certain type of behaviors and this chaos, in this sense, it is a uh, economical answer of the evolution. In the same way, I think the same thing for politics. Politics also ends in a way chaos because it discards uh, other unnumbered uh, multiple possibilities by allowing just a certain type of uh, relationships. Uh, Although we have no perfect uh, solution to the complexities of the world, our games uh, and our power games, in this sense, are uh, maybe uh, functional. Uh, perhaps uh, we participate more in these spaces because uh, without playing these games, uh, we cannot produce meaning and we cannot uh, have a, a idea about structures who are in a, a pre, who are present in the, in the world. So, 
Well, I will end uh, my uh, discussions here. Again, I my apologize. Uh, I am apologizing uh, for, for my bad English. Uh, I am quite rusty, but uh, uh, if you want, uh, if you have questions or remarks, I would be very glad uh, to have them. Umjam, thank you very much. Your great presentation, very rich, a lot of questions. I think there are. Uh, and, and by the way, thank you, uh, your reference to my speech in your university. <laughs> it was, I think, different issue, but uh, actually I wonder how uh, in analytic philosophy we can approach to this question of the, uh, the end of the philosophy. So for me, it was very useful, but this is the discussion maybe in other way we can talk. I want to uh, move on the questions if you have. I think uh, we have two questions and for questions you can raise up your hand on the on the Zoom. Uh, if you if you like we can start by Erdogan. Your question, Hocam. Uh okay, thank you Hocam. Thank you uh, Alisha Hocam for your uh, speech, for your uh, presentation. Uh I think I didn't uh, really understand uh uh, the, uh, the purpose of the Wittgenstein discussion of uh, private language uh, uh, argument thesis. Uh, well, we know, for instance, in the uh, in the uh, first period of Wittgenstein, his purpose is to to eliminate the, uh, some problems in 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 philosophy because of the misuse of language. Uh, so the question is just for clarification. Why uh, did Wittgenstein uh, discuss this problem? What is his purpose when he discuss uh, uh, when he reject the possibility of uh, private language, uh, private language? Uh, uh, and uh, well, we can understand the cryptic, the, you know, uh, criticism, etc. But uh, the the purpose is not clear for me. Why did he uh, discuss this problem? Why did he reject the possibility of uh, the the private uh, uh, language? Uh, uh, and when he reject that, he tried to uh, achieve which purpose? Which which aim in his philosophical project, especially in the later uh, period of uh, Wittgenstein? Uh, I can uh, uh, answer this, uh, of course. Uh, thank you, Erdoğan. It was a, a very meaningful question, and it helps me to formulate maybe more clearly uh, my position and the Wittgenstein position too. I think. Uh, he wanted to abandon, uh, first of all, uh, the ancient uh, correspondentist uh, view uh, of uh, truth. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the correspondentist view of truth? Uh, he, this is a naive uh, belief that uh, the language and the world can be isometric, uh, isomorphic. Einstein mm -hmm. clearly, uh, by just uh, thinking about it, lost the belief that the language can uh, represent the world in a limited way. So the main uh, force uh, behind the uh, Wittgenstein argumentation, he doesn't believe anymore in the mimetic representation, mimetic linguistic representation of the world uh, by, the, uh, by any linguistic content. So in order to have some sort of representation, uh, as he lost belief in language itself, in the capacities of the language and isolation itself, he adds other things to language. I mean, social context, uh, rules, external rules, uh, environment, I mean, uh, terrain, uh, physical conditions, uh, traffic and physical object, etc. because all these things makes again again so he adds to language other physical real uh, entities and uh, he attempts 
to reconstruct a sort of connection between uh, the game this time and uh, the real world. Because, I repeat myself, she lost the naive belief that uh, the language in isolation could represent in a isomorphic way the world as it is. I would even mention another uh, philosopher, Quine, Wilfred Orman Quine. Uh, he wrote a very important uh, essay, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, for example. I think Wittgenstein is would be quite pleased if he could uh, read uh, this essay. Uh, because uh, in there, Wittgenstein, uh, sorry, Quine uh, says quite the same things. Uh, the correspondence between a verb and a fact or, or an object is impossible to maintain or to obtain. The empiricists are uh, very well aware of this difficulty. What says Quine that empiricists did to solve this difficulty, uh, the emphasis uh, uh, enlarged the game. Uh, he said that this time the whole statement and a whole state of facts, a state of affairs of the world would correspond to each other. Again, after many uh, discussions, we understood that this would not be possible either. And finally, Klein says that Empresses, in order to solve uh, the uh, solve the problem, uh, finally says that the whole theory could represent the whole world in general. In general. And he even uh, says that maybe this is not uh, really a function functional proposal either. And Kinstein. Yeah. In this sense, uh, try to enrich, uh, try to enrich the game in order to uh, save uh, this impossible correspondentist and mimetic uh, paradigm. This is the problem with Wittgenstein. In fact, he tries to save what is uh, what cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think that this uh, isomorph isomorphic view of the language or the thought about the world is just plain nonsense. But uh, Alicia Jam, but I, as far as I know, the uh, uh, the, uh, the his thesis in the Tractatus Logic of Philosophy does not uh, lead himself to um, private language uh, idea because you know yes there is a isomorphism between language and a reality or state of affairs, the world, but uh, this isomorphism is not, uh, how do you say, personal. Uh, I mean, for instance, yes, language is not private even in the, uh, in the, uh, in his uh, first period, because language is general, language is not private. That's why, you know, we cannot say, you know, my language, your language. He talks about language in general. So that, uh, that's why I think correspondence theory doesn't lead us to private language. Can you agree with me if I say uh, the, he, I think he tried to eliminate the origin of, uh, and actually he's, he's talking about the origin of meaning. Because in, in the, uh, in the, uh, first period. Yes, it is origin of the meaning. Right, yeah. right. Yes, because the uh, in the first period, the meaning of origin is not society, is not context. Uh, yes. There is structure uh, of language. There is structure of la uh, word. They correspond to each other. Actually, there is you know the actor is not person. The act individual person. The actor is not actually society. The actor is not you know. Uh, uh, context, uh, you know, about the about the meaning, but totally in the true, second true. period, period, actually, by rejecting the uh, this private uh, language uh, possibility, uh, I think he led us to the uh, meaning of origin, which is context, which is society, which is 
political, social air. Do you agree with me uh, about this issue? Totally, totally. Uh, I, you have just uh, said the, the absolute truth. In uh, first period, in Tractatus, uh, he's logical atomist. And uh, mm -hmm. it functions uh, quite uh, automatically. Uh, word and uh, uh, atomic fact and uh, atomic concepts, uh, they are just... Uh, come together uh, in yes. an axiomatic way and this is that and it is uh, in an individual, individual mind so the origin of the meaning is explained in an axiomatic way in an individual uh, mind i am agreeing with this and his in his last period uh, he lost faith uh, on this on this he yes. abandoned he rejected his own view and one of the arguments is the um, uh, private mind, if you make uh, attention, uh, is really uh, limited. Imagine, uh, just make, uh, I propose to everybody to make an introspection now, just now. How many words we have at this instant now? A few words, isn't it? I mean, uh, our attention span is not really uh, large. At each instant, at each second, we can think that at most uh, five or six words, two or three phrases, it is really limited. I mean, the actual content of a living consciousness is quite limited if you make attention. Then, uh, all these uh, meanings, where we do store them, this is one of the problems of the later period. If uh, the memory is there to make the connections with the older meanings, this won't be as uh, dependable as we hope. Because uh, I cannot make conf uh, confident uh, to, to the memory, etc. So Wittgenstein thinks that even in a second case, the attribution of the same uh, atomic concept to an uh, atomic fact would be totally problematic because we have no third criteria to help us for this attribution, for this connection. So each time this atomic fact and this atomic uh, concept would be uh, connected ad hoc, arbitrarily, because without an external help, there is no basis to find uh, each time uh, this uh, concept. Let me uh, give you an example, uh, real time, real life example. Uh, imagine that uh, you name uh, birds, uh, pigeons. Uh, uh, they are quite indistinguishable for us, isn't it? I, mean, I don't know how to discern pigeons. But I can name one pigeon just uh, now because there is one. I will call him uh, Dudul. Well, Dudul is the name of the pigeon. Just now I established a sort of uh, micro meaning uh, connection with a pigeon and with a name. And two, uh, two hours later I saw another pigeon on my balcony. Is it Dudul or not? I cannot know that. This is why uh, the connection doesn't hold without uh, external help, says Wittgenstein. Uh, uh, unique causation is not possible, as well as, this is the later period of Wittgenstein, unique causation is not possible, as well as, as, well as uh, unique reference. Because, in fact, Reference is made because we think that there is a, con a causal connection. In every time we make references in real world with the language, because we sense or feel that there is causal connections between uh, such things, my feelings and my concepts, for example. So if unique causation, uh, co unique causal connection doesn't work uh, equally, unique uh, references would not work. And in this case, logical atomism would not be possible. And for a private mind or for an inner mind, it would not work in this sense. So Wittgenstein thinks that we need help 
external help to make the connection because he don't abandon that a connection is uh, possible. He still believes that a connection should exist, but in this case, he thinks that you need help from other things. I mean, game theory, external context, uh, inter, inter social uh, connections, etc. This is it, my uh, answer. Thank, thank you, thank you, Joe. Later, I will some question, but now for it. Uh, thank you, Erdo Hocam. Uh, please, Kerim Hocam, you. Okay, thank you um, very much, uh, Arish Hoca, for the presentation. I am very uh, most interested in the uh, po political sort of uh, part of the, like the second part of the presentation. And maybe I should apologize because now I might not even have time to, I have another important commitment. I might not have time to listen to the complete answer, but inshallah I will in the uh, uh, recording. So he, here's my question, Hojam. Um, Please. Um, you mentioned this idea of fluidity and how social practices and games are fluid. For example, people might cheat or, uh, you know, different kinds of not following the rules, right? And uh, how this such kind of fluidity will create problems for Wittgenstein, right? Um, and I'm wondering if he, why wouldn't Wittgenstein simply say something along these lines? First, the idea of cheating and all of these breaking the rules make sense only if we accept that there is some kind of standard orthodox kind of rules, right? There has to be some kind of certain level of stability. Therefore, the fluidity is only threatening if it reaches a certain threshold. If there is, if everyone is cheating, then yes, the whole game is, you know, um, disintegrated, right? The practice dissolves. But since we are the kind of beings that we make meaning, whether we like it or not, I mean, we keep somehow structuring the world in one way or another. The, in the very process that a certain game or a certain practice dissolves or uh, disintegrates, another social practice, another game gets formed. Uh, uh, so he might simply say, yes, the fluidity is only, um, how can I say, it's only an indication that the games are being transformed from one game to another, right? And this relates, I think, to the idea of politics. And if, if, if I understood correctly, I mean, politics, the way you described it, is some kind of uh, selective power of games. And the election is basically that, that which help us to structure, you said, let's say the social or political um, worlds. And it does so by allowing us, by allowing certain relations and excluding ex excluding other relations. And, uh, and therefore, as we participate in politics, we, we can't, we can, even if we are against the current politics, we should participate in order to change the process of selection of that particular kind of politics and maybe transform it into another political game that is, is let's say, in our view, more equitable or something totally like this. With this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is my, just okay. just maybe some broad reflections. Uh, it was a, Kieran, thank you very much. It was a really bright uh, formulation from your own part. Uh, why cheating makes sense? Uh, you said very beautiful phrase. Uh, and with your permission, I would like to use it uh, somewhere else, if you uh, accord me this permission. Uh, it, it was a part of my presentations, uh, I talk about the cheating, etc. It was a rhetor rhetorical way of presenting things. Wittgenstein is, itself did not have uh, a big problem with the fluidity of the games. I mean, he assumed it. This is uh, rather me who was asking this question, 
in order to return to the affair uh, and say quite the same things uh, as you. I mean, in real life, but uh, in any case, uh, the meaning is not uh, each time uh, so uh, so focused or so uh, definitionally complete for us. So there is uh, fluidity in meanings too. And this is not a problem. Maybe this is a good thing because uh, without this fluidity, any meaning or just use, let's us use uh, the concept as a verb for meaning. If uh, concepts would not be fluid, they would not be adaptable. So there is a good, uh, there is some reason that the meanings are fluid and dynamic in this sense, and uh, because it helps to humanity to adapt to develop new meanings, etc. So this is not a problem in itself. It is a part of the problem, but uh, it is part of the reality uh, equally. And we need to participate. Uh, each participation, each uh, move from our part, in fact, change the total game. In the sense, uh, uh, you cannot watch, watch a game, but the only way of being in game is participating as a player in this game. Uh, in any case, there is no external uh, seats in this world game. Everybody are inside. I would. I don't know if there is another question, but I have a small example. Uh, Kant once uh, asked the question, if demons uh, establish a republic, what would happen? He said that uh, if these demons are intelligent, they would give themselves a law or a constitution. He used the word uh, constitution. And if they give this, themselves a constitution, I mean rules, uh, this time they would be normal demons, they would be angels. Because being good or being angel is just having a rule. Why? Just reading uh, all of these discussions. Because rule, having a rule is to reject some behavior and about accepting other type of behaviors. I mean, being having a rule is being directional about our behaviors. In other words, having a rule means having a telos, a name, an idea to follow. This is how a rule function. And it is a very selective mechanism, mechanism because he rejects some other type of uh, behavior. In this sense, uh, the truth or the meaning or everything bad, everything uh, meaningful and good is connected with this uh, concept. Uh, I would even use a citation from Tolstoy, uh, maybe you remember how Anna Karenina begins. He says that every happy marriage is the same, uh, while every unhappy marriages are different in many multiple ways. So it also is connected with multiplicity, with uh, confusion, with uh, uh, infinitely many possibilities with bad marriages and he uh, thought about the happy marriage uh, as something very selective very narrow in nature i mean it is more in a sense uh, the more selective the more you have a telos about something the more you have a success story according to Tolstoy. And I think this is the whole story about Wittgenstein. The rules, it is the important part. The game, it is the reality part. The game is always present. Uh, sorry to answer so long. If there's another question, I would be very happy to. Thank you, Hojam. Thank you.
I see Chadash. Yes, he wants to talk. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ali Shujan, thank you for the talk. First of all, um, we already mentioned the relation between Quine and Wittgenstein. It was so nice to nice for me to listen uh, theory of meaning with relation to politics because I've been recently thinking about how I can uh, relate Quine's theory of meaning into the political issues. So my, my question actually had two parts, but we already answered the first part of it. So I'll direct directly ask my question. As far as I understand, you accepted that if uh, language works like games, uh, there, so there cannot be any external point of view, external uh, point of view outside of the language or languages in general. If this is so, do you think that is it possible to say something completely new in politics? I mean, if it's uh, if it is also a game like language games, and if there is no external point of view, do you think it's possible? Or yes, yeah. I think that this is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, even if Wittgenstein uh, speaks a lot about games, etc., he is very sensitive uh, to the collapse of games. I mean, the accidents or uh, the absurdities who games, uh, the bumps on the road. If he used uh, the word bumps on the road. Uh, even if you play a game uh, or a game of uh, car, uh, you can have accidents. And he gives a lot of value to these accidents. And uh, when these sort of bombs are encountered, the game itself uh, changes forcefully because uh, humans adapt to reality and the games adapt to the reality. Uh, I think Wittgenstein accepts uh, such uh, possibilities of collapsing and uh, total uh, refoundation of games is possible for himself because clearly he says that uh, there is some impossible situations then a game could not be possibly played. Every conditions for the existence of the game could collapse. A nuclear war or uh, earthquake, uh, anything you imagine. So you have to imagine a new sort of game, he says. Now, Wittgenstein thinks that there is exceptions who arises in games, and they are very uh, valuable epistemically and ontologically. And you have to start from uh, them to modify or invent new games. He's, he would be perfectly okay with that, if I understand Wittgenstein correctly. And in this sense, I would just had this idea now because of your very bad question. I can connect uh, Wittgenstein with Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt said that the uh, government or the power is the real power, the meaning of the real power is the capacity of to decide the exception. I mean, decide when the rules are no longer uh, working. Uh, for Carl Schmitt, this is one of the signs of being a real uh, ruler. So there is uh, such sort of inventivity and creativity in creation of rules and the most valuable moment, this is my point of view, is when you see that ancient rules are no longer working correctly because the life changed or the world changed, etc. There's a crisis, there's a bump on the road, road there's an accident, and you have to reconfigure, uh, reconfigure it, uh, the game. So, uh, this uh, lecture of rules does not uh, block us to imagine new rules at any moment uh, if it is necessary. Okay, thank you. Okay. I see Isaac Hojan's rise up and Hojan, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh... Ali, Ali Shajam, uh, I, have a, I have a practical question. Uh, there are many different uh, 
the mention of this topic, but mainly I will focus on one more practical side. Uh, when we consider uh, Wittgenstein's basic premises on the private language, as you mentioned, language by its nature, a public social phenomenon, social phenomenon, and therefore relies on shared practices, activities, rituals, and uh, the meaning of words emerge from their use within a community. There are many other premises, as you as you mentioned before. My question is, uh, as you know, currently artificial intelligence or some form of AI applications can talk to people and develop in principle their own special languages. And probably in the future, we will we cannot understand what they're meaning uh, in terms of AI. Uh, civilization. Could such examples undermine or disprove Wittgenstein claim about private language? And to put it uh, more yeah. clearly, yeah. is Wittgenstein theory specific to human species, societies, or can it be applied to other type of species such as robots or artificial intelligence? Uh, very, thank you. Uh, uh, very thank you, uh, Isak Ojan, for this uh, so uh, so much interesting question. Uh, I think we should ask these questions because we have a uh, novel development, uh, etc. I am personally very interested in those questions, and even I participate uh, quite frequently in our computer department to such. Uh, uh, events uh, they they i am invited sometimes in the uh, courses uh, to speak as a philosopher but uh, what is interesting here Wittgenstein would perhaps uh, uh, find a sort of justification in artificial language uh, era because uh, we we are talking about training for example uh, artificial intelligence models or the big language models uh, we have to train them uh, on uh, human practice this sort of training it's already there in Wittgenstein he says that in a language uh, the essential uh, part of it is our training animal or uh, humans uh, without a distinction so uh, he will just see this is my opinion uh, new developments in artificial uh, intelligence as, as sort of corroborations of his uh, approach. And again, uh, uh, shall we limit uh, his uh, analysis to only humans or other artificial sentient beings or not? Uh, I think it can start uh, enlarging uh, his analysis to other type of uh, intelligent uh, agents. And uh, between uh, communities. Uh, already I mentioned that uh, this uh, this approach works as well uh, with the animals because animals benefit uh, from the games exactly similarly as humans uh, from the evolutionary point of view. So why not? Uh, this could be enlarged uh, to other type of uh, linguistic sort of activities in any case uh, this would be uh, applicable to all sort of uh, symbolic situations because in language we are dealing with symbols and uh, in all sort of symbolic situations uh, this would hold i think thank you very much again for your very interesting question i will think about it more also in the following days. I think Arzal Ojan, you want to talk again, right? Yes, yeah, so Ojan, if there are, there is no other question, I can ask uh, some question. Yes. Uh, Alisha Ojan, this topic is very uh, beautiful topic. That's why, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, it hit us many, uh, you know, for many questions. Uh, let's follow, for instance, your uh, example, you know, pigeon. Uh, 
actually by uh, uh, you talk about for instance uh, um, their cards their cards uh, the, you know for, uh, inner conversation actually yes at the beginning the deck cards uh, was burning a society and you know he spoke the language and he 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 were familiar to the meaning of this language etc that's why it's uh, his inner uh, conversation is not really a good example uh, for private uh, language maybe as a thought experiment there is only one way to to check whether it is possible or not. I think this way is uh, can be like this. You know, imagine, let's suppose there is a, a man or a woman, you know, where he grew up all in an island, isolated island, inhabited island. He or she, uh, you know, uh, didn't hear any words, any, you know, things. Sorry, uh, Erdogan. Hi, Bin Yaksan. You need to say. Well, this is just, uh, of course, yes. Bin Yaksan is also, you know, uh, man or an, an author you know he creation this uh, example uh, actually but the question is whether this person needs uh, language or not this is another point but just as an a thought experiment you know let's suppose you know he find himself as in without before without uh, hearing any words etc so by observing you know for instance in your example by observing the first pigeon and then instead of bilbil let's say you know uh, uh, he he call it just a sound uh, okay a sound just tick, for instance but by following uh, after the uh, uh, first pigeon uh, when this uh, second one came uh, by observing the uh, first one he can or she can call the other one pick as well, pick as well, and the other. Why? Because there are similarities. You know, for instance, in in uh, harmonic uh, school, there is a preconception. He already or she already have a preconception about these things. So by for referring this to preconception, he called the second pigeon as also, for instance, a tick, the third one tick. And by following this process, maybe, you know, uh, he or she can create language, uh, uh, you know, uh, with sounds, with voices, or with, uh, you know, uh, any uh, letters, etc. There is no letters, maybe. So uh, I think uh, still, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is, uh, there can be possibility of uh, private language, but still there, there is rule. Understand. Uh, so uh, I think uh, to create a language, uh, maybe it is not necessary to live in a society. Just that thought experiment, I ask this question. Uh, very, very uh, good question again, uh, Adolajan. Uh, you gave me good directions also to think about later. Uh, but uh, I think you, uh, the, the important part of your uh, hypothesis uh, was the word uh, similarities. Uh, by using similarities between uh, two pigeons, uh, you would say that the Reference could be established, etc. Wittgenstein would object to this. I will try to reconstitute uh, his answer. Mm -hmm. he, he would say that uh, you don't have two pigeons at the same time in your consciousness because one is in the past, the other one, actual one, is here present in your consciousness, but the other one is not there. So you cannot really compare them in a real living consciousness simultaneously uh, because you don't have them together. Uh, this is why consciousness is not a sufficient basis uh, to make such references. Memory. Memory. Yes, memory would work, but memory uh, is not solving the problem either because uh, in order to check the memory or make confidence uh, to the memory, 
you need again another point of reference. It works as a third man argument. Each time you want to connect something present with another thing not present, you need a third external point of reference. This is why Wittgenstein uh, wants to re reject such a attribution of meaning. I would even say that we encounter the same situation in Plato's dialogue Theotokos. There he has two examples about the cage of birds and uh, wax uh, to discuss the origin of error. And it is uh, quite the same uh, problem, third man problem. Uh, in order to verify that a shape in the wax previously imprinted with an object, and in order to verify if the new object actually at hand corresponds to this ancient shape, uh, I still need a third point of reference. And I don't want to prolongate uh, my answer, but I think uh, this is this would be the Wittgenstein uh, uh, objection. And other uh, another thing came to my mind uh, with your help. Uh, I think the German emperor made a, such a, a human experiment. Uh, at this time, uh, there were the, the, uh, there was a theory about the first human language, and it was supposed uh, to be Hebrew. I mean, if a child uh, left alone without any human uh, interaction, they believed at this time that he would, the child would speak uh, autonomously, autonomously and uh, naturally uh, Hebrew. And the records say that uh, Frederick uh, imprisoned uh, two childs, infants, I mean, very small child, in an uh, isolated environment. And he waited with uh, his servants, uh, his uh, scholars, etc. They waited if uh, such uh, infants would speak. But the uh, the uh, records are not clear. Uh, this is just a story they uh, told, tell us. Uh, but uh, uh, these infants uh, died because of the isolation or because of the malnutrition. I mean, this uh, experience, real experience of seeing what would be the first uh, autonomously uh, created language would be did not succeed. And if Wittgenstein knew this story, he, it would say, listen, look, uh, without a social interaction, without a social game, these infants would never speak. And they died from the solitary confinement, would say Wittgenstein. Uh, I mean, it is really difficult to uh, decide, but I am arguing with you. We have to invent uh, some sort of thought experiments uh, to further cl clarify such sort of uh, situation. But Einstein would refuse that uh, in isolation one can invent such a language. And also there is Haydn Yaksan, Ibn Tufay. It's a art story written in uh, 1000 years ago. And it is just uh, such a thought experiment. I read this book, but I have to read again with this question in mind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Chadash, do you have any question? Actually, if, uh, I'd make a, I'd like to make a contribution about this last topic. If there is no other question. Please. I mean, if, if, even if uh, we don't have a chance to find out how was the first language developed? We know that without social interaction, the infants are not able to develop, uh, develop their language skills because there is this hypothesis of critical time hypothesis when the children 
uh, are not involved in social interactions until a critical time, maybe eight years old, maybe 11, it changes. Uh, after that, they, they are not able to learn the language at all anymore. The, uh, the developmental psychology proposes such uh, researches, so I just want to contribute in a way that probably the learning language requires sociality in the first place. This is in behalf in uh, this is uh, uh, supporting Wittgenstein. Yes, yes, for sure. So any kind of holistic theory of meaning uh, generally uses such research uh, programs, conclusions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chadash. Is there another question? I look on my list. I think no, but if it's possible just for a short time, I will contribute to your another point, Ojan. Uh, it is interesting. it's interesting for me because you refer to the end of the philosophy in Wittgenstein that I'm interested also, but my source uh, was not in Wittgenstein, as you know. It was more Heidegger, they, uh, French yeah. philosophers, uh, Heidegger, and some Europeans. Uh, in, in, yes, in continental philosophy, Blanchot, Heidegger, Derrida, etc. Three philosophers, at least as I know, they talked about the, the end of the philosophy or the, the death of the philosophy. So in, in Wittgenstein, you, you talked about that, and, and you said there is another version of the and at the end of the philosophy. Uh, for if I understand well, I think maybe there is or there are two ways to approach the, the this issue. The first, if we take philosophical discourse as the private private language, as the creation of the any philosophy, any any philosopher. So if we can approach the, uh, the philosophy as private, private language, then uh, uh, very quickly that we can say there is no possible to the philosophy as, uh, itself in the universal as universal meaning. Because we know at least there are a lot of school of philosophy and uh, they have their private language probably. If you pick just one philosoph philosopher, for example, for instance, Husserl, when you read Husserl's works, you went into directly to private language, private terms, etc. So you can think another philosopher in the same direction. The first point, uh, as a question I can ask, can we put any philosophical discourse in the private language, or is there any possibility as meta, I don't know, meta uh, language as the philosophy? The second point that we can approach the, this issue, I think this argumentation about the, uh, if I understand, of course, uh, the non-possibility of the reference to outside of the language. If the philosophy is inside of the language, then in the second point, uh, when we think about political issue, we have the, the conflict, as you say very well, we have the conflict, we have the, the war between the groups, between the, between the uh, I don't know, the, the, the language, so the result, the consequence of this election or selection in your terms should be outside of the language because the conflict itself is not referring to language, if I understand. Sure, sure. The conflict needs more thing than the language, right? And this is maybe the powerful, we can say, the very... Brutal, brutal, powerful. So, the weakness of the philosophy today, if we can say, the weakness of the philosophy is, is it inside of this issue of 
the political question, which refers to outside of the language, to outside of the language. Okay. Yes, Ujjah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alisaid. Uh, don't you have two questions? Um, uh, the first one, uh, I think that the change time uh, choose a side uh, in this uh, affair. He showed us uh, clearly the way of the universality, because uh, in the private, all these things are synonym of subjectivity. Wittgenstein uh, did want to reject uh, such a subjective uh, view of doing philosophy, I think. And he wanted to have a, a more universal way of uh, thinking. Uh, this is why he makes a bigger game theory about the meaning, etc. Uh, second part, I am totally agreeing with you because you are implying that the real problem can be solved uh, outside the language, in the life itself. Uh, this would be the very meaning of the uh, Wittgenstein uh, proposal, because uh, he doesn't uh, take the linguistic part as the sole basis of the meaning. A lot of things other than the linguistics enter into play in order to form a basis for the meaning in Wittgenstein, in his later periods. So the real meaning is an extra linguistic meaning. And listening to you, I had an idea that I wrote it just now. I could call this presentation with a new name, I would say, between quotes, meaning is not a verb. You understand this? I mean, this is not a verb. Uh, yes. Meaning not have uh, such number of letters. It is something uh, extra linguistic. And the proposal of Wittgenstein, in any way, the inspirations that he gave me or other people, works in this sense. And is, is it this point non-philosophical, we can say, right? Uh, the last one that you said. It depends. It depends. Either you consider, uh, it depends of your uh, approach, mm -hmm. either you consider uh, philosophy non-linguistic, mm -hmm. uh, you can view philosophy as something in uh, real life matter, as a real life matter, uh, linguistics or uh, written records would be just a small part of it. Or if philosophy is a exclusively linguistic affair, in this sense, Wittgenstein uh, wants us to abandon philosophy. It okay. depends how uh, you see uh, Wittgenstein or you see philosophy. But I, I would rather uh, think from Marx, as he said in uh, I'm not Marxist, uh, but I would uh, repeat his uh, good uh, conclusion. Uh, he said in uh, the criticism of uh, Feyerbach that uh, till now the philosopher on did uh, interpret the world, but now the real way of uh, now it is time to build build the world and make the world, he said that. I mean, in this sense, making things in real life means for me as a way of, a way of uh, doing the correct philosophy. I mean, this is not just a linguistic activity. The linguistic part is, of course, important, but it is not the only basis of the philosophical activity. And I am agreeing with Max. It necessitates also to modify, to assume a part, to enter, to collaborate, to make decisions in real life, to build, to construct things. And I would say sometimes philosophy can only be made with a hammer, 
as Nietzsche said once. And this inclusion of the hammer would be okay with Wittgenstein because it could very well be part of a game. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Very clear answer for me. If there is no question, Actually, there are lots of questions outside to jump, but uh, time is expired. <laughs> yeah. We should uh, have a real meeting and have tea for the rest of these mm. questions. <laughs> Why not? Without a tea, uh, it is difficult. <laughs> and it shows the success of the this talk, I think, uh, creating the, a lot of questions. Ojam, thank you very much for your contribution us and thank you for your participation for your participation all of uh, guests and colleagues see you in another few talks i hope in next year see you bye okay thank you very thank much you. Uh, thank you. Uh, have a good night uh, alisa if it is possible to send me a link of this recording i would be very glad of course Ojan. yes yeah. Donc, uh, again, uh, thank you very much uh, for having such a big uh, uh, patience. I don't know the word for patience, but sabır gösterdiğiniz için hocalarıma teşekkür ediyorum. Biz teşekkür ederim hocam. Görüşmek üzere. Kendinize iyi bakın.